This is my song about Gage Coble, who recently we lost. You lifted me up when I fell down, when I would mess up, you showed me how. I'm gonna miss you more than you could imagine, you could fathom in my life. Gage was a really kind person, and his compassion was unmatched by anyone else I've ever met. He was always um, a positive influence in people's lives, and uh, I learned a lot from Gage. He and I were best friends, I would say. I mean, he was one of my closest friends. He was never a rock star. He never wanted to be a rock star. He never wanted the attention, but he was always looking for a way to help someone. And um, I remember even during band camp, it would be 90 degrees outside, but he would still bring jackets because he knew that sometimes when we would practice inside, the air conditioning would make some people cold. And so he, even in 90 degree weather, would sometimes bring jackets because he just didn't want anyone to get cold in the AC. And I think that just really describes the kind of person he was. He was just so kind all the time. Uh, even the day of his uh of his suicide, he was joking and laughing and carrying on, and, and uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't something that was on our minds um, in, in any way, shape, or form. This episode of In the Shadows was brought to you by Baby Grace, offering material, emotional, and spiritual support and development for families with young children. Visit babygrace.org. In this episode of In the Shadows, Mental Health and Suicide, Gage's Story. Welcome to In the Shadows, where we shed light on difficult issues right here in our community. I'm Patty Lemons. Mental illness affects one in five people. And just in the last three years, that's increased by about 30%. So that's a pretty staggering statistic. And just since starting this project, almost everybody that I've come in contact with, they share a story of someone that they've lost to suicide. It is all around us, and it's one of the scariest things that we're facing. I know that I lie awake at night, worried about my own children when they're going through a rough time, and my siblings, and I wonder how in the world someone deals with such a huge traumatic loss. My hope with this podcast series is to educate people in our community so that we can learn about this epidemic and I can ask some of those questions. If you have a question that you're wondering about, just send me a message and next time I have a professional in, I can try to address that question. Gage Coble was a 15-year-old freshman at Nixa High School. And I had personally met his dad, Dave Coble, a couple of times through work and, and we became Facebook friends as a result. So... When I heard the news of his son's passing, I was shocked, and obviously my heart was breaking for his family. I didn't know Gage. I never got a chance to meet him. I just know people whose lives changed dramatically the day he took his life. I actually learned about Gage's death the day I was frantically searching on Facebook for an explanation behind Jason Spell's suicide, and I saw these posts from a young girl who was Facebook friends with me and and both Jason and Gage. And it was so confusing, but I learned that Gage and Jason died the same day, both from suicide. Processing this kind of loss is so hard for us as adults, and I can't imagine what it's like for young teenagers to process the loss of one of their friends and how difficult it is for them to talk about. But I think it's really important that we keep that dialogue open with our kids. One person who takes solace in speaking is Gage's father, Dave. When I reached out to him, he agreed to have lunch with me the next day, and I really wished I'd had my recorder with me. He provided so much insight into the impact this has had on his family. Joining me today is Dave, who's graciously agreed to chat with me. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Patty. What you've experienced is every parent's worst nightmare, and I applaud you for your bravery in in coming here today. First, can you tell me about Gage? Who was Gage Coble? Yeah, absolutely. Gage was a uh, very caring young man, um, always caring about the other person, always looking out for someone that needed help. Um, His body was very strong. He was 15 years old and um, very well liked at his school. 
Um, he was always um, a positive influence in people's lives, and uh, I learned a lot from Gage. Tell me about his group of friends. Uh, Gage was in the high school band, Nick's a high school band, and, and had a lot of really, really good close friends in the band. Um, one of the uh, members of the band reached out to me earlier this week, actually, uh, checking on things, and uh, they're getting ready for senior night um, at the school. So um, he had a lot of really good friends, and that was his group. That was his, uh, that was his circle. What are some of your favorite memories? We played guitar together. Um, we spent a lot of time together playing uh, cards, uh, playing poker, uh, playing a lot of different card games. Um, especially the last couple of years, we spent a lot of time together and, and talked about music. He was very artistic. Uh, I always like to say he was an artist. He just hadn't found his art. Um, but a guitar player, uh, did some painting. We, we had a lot of fun together. Um, and, uh, he, we were very close. You said that Gage was a very giving kid and he even grew his hair for locks of love. Can you just kind of paint a picture of, of the essence of Gage and what you want everybody to remember about him? Yeah, that's exactly right. He, uh, he was growing his hair out for locks of love. Um, he, his hair was down to the middle of his back. Um, and although he was a guitar player, uh, and a musician, he he was never a rock star. He never wanted to be a rock star. He never wanted the, the attention, but he was always looking for a way to help someone. And uh, he was growing his hair out for locks of love. Uh, he would come to me before school. One morning he came to me and said he needed five dollars. Uh, and I said, why? And he said, because uh, this person didn't have lunch yesterday and I want to make sure they have lunch today. Um, so he was always looking for a way to help. And, uh, you know, I think I learned a lot from him and the way he looked at uh, helping others constantly. A big percentage of people who die from suicide struggle with mental illness for, for many years. Did Gage show any signs? Gage had severe anxiety attacks. Um, even as a young boy, uh, would have uh, anxiety attacks. And when I say anxiety attacks, I, I mean... Um, nervous breakdown type uh, attacks. He was uh, he was carrying a heavy load in his mind, and uh, sometimes that would get to him. He never really knew when or where it was going to happen. So then the anxiety of when the next attack was going to happen. Um, so you know he was um, he was seeing uh, a counselor and had been for several years. He was, uh, um, you know, talking to people about that. He just couldn't figure out uh, what it was that was triggering those in his mind. And so uh, I think the thought of that always is about to happen was always uh, a mental uh, uh, roadblock for him. Um, and we never were, really were able to figure out what that was. So you said he saw a counselor. How long did he see a counselor? He'd been seeing a counselor for several years um and he had been um uh you know it's hard to get into uh that type of counseling and and he had been getting help for several years um been taking a couple of uh, uh medications and a couple of things to try to help him um uh you know in the last year um before um he committed suicide um you know he did get a little darker and a little more removed, but it was never an obvious uh, removal from society. Uh, even the day of his uh, of his suicide, he was joking and laughing and carrying on, and, and uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't something that was on our minds um, in, in any way, shape, or form. So I think what's really scary for all parents is all of our teens exhibit challenging behaviors from time to time. What can you tell me and other parents about the subtle things to look out for, and what advice do you have? That's a very, very big question. Um, as far as things to look for, uh, you know, since that's happened uh, to our family, I've done a lot of reading and, and, and research and different things, and I've looked back to see if there were, if there was something that we could have uh, that we could have seen. Uh, that would have 
that would have told us that this was going to happen. And there wasn't. Um, I, I will say that removing yourself from friends and family would be an issue um, that you would want to look for. But my my thought process on the on the whole subject is really to just bring the subject up, to bring the subject to the kitchen table, to bring the subject to conversation. Um, the subject of suicide is uh, something that we are afraid to talk about, and and one of the reasons why I'm here is because I'm not afraid to talk about it. But we're afraid to talk about it because uh, for some reason we've been taught that if you bring it up, it might uh, spur someone on, and I don't think that's the case. I think uh, it needs to be a topic of conversation, whether you feel like the child is healthy or whether you feel like the child might be hurting um, because you just don't know. Uh, I've talked to relatives. I've talked to neighbors. I've talked to uh, school administrators. I've talked to counselors. I've talked to a lot of different people, even uh, state representatives up at the Capitol in Missouri. Um, and really, my thought process is we just all need to bring it up. We need to have a conversation um, that needs to be brought up. It's in their faces. It's in their social media. It's a part of our culture. And they are thinking about it either in a positive or a negative light, and you don't know until you bring it up and have that conversation and have that, uh, that conversation and look them in the eye and, and ask them what their thoughts are on uh, suicide and how it's affected them and how um, they perceive that and how their friends perceive that. Until you have that conversation, you really don't know at all. And not bringing it up, to me, is much worse than bringing it up. How would you suggest that parents approach their teenagers with that question? What do you know about suicide? How has suicide affected you? Um, do you know anyone that's attempted suicide? Do you know anyone that's talking about suicide? I guarantee you a short three or four questions and you're going to have a conversation. And you're going to get a feel for what their perspective is on suicide. Um, they're going to tell you, even if they don't want to tell you, a couple of good questions and, and you're going to know that they have a friend that has a problem and that is thinking about it or that they have been in conversations at school about suicide and the glorification of suicide. Um, I think it's just something that we need to talk about. I've had several parents reach out to me and with concerns about their child and uh, my my uh, response is always, let's just not worry about it. Let's just ask. Let's talk. If we can talk about it, I think we can know where the, where the child is. So if a teenager says that they have a friend that they're worried about, what do you say to them? To the teenager that has a friend that's worried, that, that they're worried about, um, you know, a couple of things that might be. Number one, it might be they might be talking about themselves and not about, about the friend. So you have to be careful and make sure. But no matter what it is, if, if, if it's an adult that has a friend that they're worried about or a child that has a friend that they're worried about, that, that person needs help. That person needs uh, attention. That person needs to talk to somebody. And sometimes uh, they may not want to, but that that doesn't matter. We, we need to have conversations. Somebody, a counselor at school, needs to be uh, aware. Um, other friends need to be aware. There's never, there's never a reason to avoid this subject. If we talk about suicide, do you think there's a risk that we're planting ideas in people's heads? I don't think so, and I'll, I'll explain why. I think it's already... Uh, being talked about and glorified in other places. We're not bringing it up as a surprise to somebody. We're bringing it up to have a conversation about it. It's already in it's already in the public domain. It's already on social media. It's already on TV and Netflix and it's already in it's already a part of their life and a part of their culture. We are we're not bringing it up. We're just trying to find where they are on the subject. Um, it's already there. Um, to avoid it is is almost ignorant. It's already there. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you think about it. Um, I know there are many parents that have 
uh, children watch the the Netflix uh, series just so they can have a conversation about it. I'm not that way. I I've not seen it, and I'm not going to see it. I wouldn't suggest somebody seeing it, but I do appreciate the thought process of it's already there. It's already a part of the culture. Let's talk about it as opposed to avoiding it. So take me back to that day if you feel comfortable, uh, February twenty second. What was that day like? And can you tell me about the events leading up to his death? Uh, February 22nd, I got a text from my oldest son first. Um, He had been alerted by some of Gage's friends that something bad was was going on. Gage had been talking to uh, several of his friends via text and was talking about uh, committing suicide. The text I got was from my oldest son uh, about 4.50 in the afternoon. Um, I immediately started towards home as fast as I could go without uh, just knowing that I needed to be there very, very quickly. Uh, I got a call from um, his mother uh, shortly after that, Um, but it was uh, not a very good call. She was just uh, screaming on the other end of the line. Um, I called the emergency services uh, immediately and and said, I think something bad is about to happen. Um, and I couldn't remember the address. Um, and uh, I, I was trying to give the address to the 911 operator. And I said, it's in Nixa, and it's on a street like this, and I can't remember what it's called. I'm trying to get there as fast as I could. And she stopped, and she said, is it this street? And I said, yes, that's it. She said, well, they're already there. And um, I I, just the, the madness of the moment um, was... Uh, something that I, I, I would never wish on anyone. I got there. <clears throat> there was uh, there were people everywhere. There was emergency services. There were police. There were ambulances. Um, as I uh, got out of the car, my daughter was uh, was there with someone outside, and they were calming her down. I touched base with her real quick. I went to the house, and as I got to the front step. They were uh, screaming at me to get out of the way. They were wheeling him out on the stretcher. Um, So uh, I knew then that something very, very bad had happened. Um, The bedlam of the situation, uh, I'm not one to uh, break down in intense situations, so I was trying to gather facts as quickly as I could. Um, Then his mother and I jumped in a car um, and we drove as quickly as we could to the hospital. Um, They put us in a room uh, at the uh, the emergency side of the hospital and within a few minutes um, came to us and let us know that um, that there there wouldn't be a chance of recovery from uh, his injury. they they let us know that fairly quickly. Uh, he did uh, he did his body was very strong, um, so he did uh, hang on for three days, and we were there with him in the hospital for three days, um, uh, constantly. Myself, uh, his older brother, and his mother, uh, and we made all appropriate decisions together as a group. Um, and um, and then he passed on the uh, on the Saturday following uh, the Wednesday that it happened. I can't imagine what that was like seeing your child. The uh, there is no um, there there is nothing like I don't believe there's nothing like seeing your child uh, lay there. Um, knowing th- that um, there's not going to be recovery. Then, um, you know, the outpouring of friends and family and 
uh, his friends and people coming to the hospital and staying and and everybody wanting to help and there's nothing anybody can do to help um, you know I remember going into the waiting room it was a large waiting room um, and I remember speaking to the group of students uh, his friends and friends of friends that were there um, for for many hours and, and days it seemed like um, and I remember speaking to them and, and talking to them about um, you know how we're going to deal with this and what this means and and you know giving them comfort um, because they were they're, they're young kids that were that were upset and uh, and didn't know how to deal with this um, I've I've thought a lot about it since then and I really feel like that uh, my job or my purpose was uh, to speak to the healthy people at that point about how to look for the hurting person and uh, and to be positive in their life um, we can't uh, we can't sometimes talk to the hurting person uh, sometimes they can't hear us um, and sometimes we can't we I mean obviously we can't shake a 15 year old by the shoulders and say you know you have nothing to be depressed about you have nothing to worry about uh, they can't hear that but we can talk to the healthy people um, and encourage them to be uplifting to those in, in their circle and I think I think from that moment on um, that was uh, kind of how I looked at it now uh, it's not been easy and there's nothing harder uh, I don't I don't know there's nothing harder as a parent to deal with that and then to sit down with uh, his younger sister my daughter and explain to her uh, what had happened in, in a very careful way um, explain to her why her brother's uh, not around and and what happened the 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 following few weeks the following few months um was a blur <clears throat> i remember uh the first time uh i was home i wasn't home for several days obviously i was just at the hospital and the first time i was home uh i remember taking a shower and not being able to stand it was the first time that I had been alone in several days. And the first time you're alone, um, the weight, uh, I remember falling down uh, on the from the weight um, in the shower. And uh, <laughs> I thought about what I had seen in the, uh, in the hospital room bathrooms. <clears throat> There's a... Uh, there's usually a little uh, uh, help string that's hanging there that if a patient is is stuck in the bathroom or whatever, they can pull the string and someone will come help them. And I remember thinking that I needed that uh, and that we kind of all needed that. Um, we've all needed that sometimes in our lives, um, but I didn't have that at the time. And I was like, well, how can I... How can I help keep this from happening again? How can I help another father uh, so that he doesn't have to deal with what I've had to deal with? Um, but the weight of that situation was was unreal. You're, you're supposed to be the leader of your household. You're supposed to be the strongest person. You're supposed to be the one that that uh, that takes on uh, burdens, and then you, you, for a moment you can't uh, you can't deal with it yourself. Um, it was very heavy. It was uh, there's there's things that have happened that I've been told about during that time period of a few months that I don't remember. Um, someone mentioned uh, a movie. No, oh, that we saw that movie, and don't you remember that? I don't remember. There's times that I don't remember, um, and it took a long time to to uh, to be able to kind of come to grips with with what was happening and what had happened and. Um, people ask if you're angry I'm not angry and people ask if you're you know upset or sad I don't I just think it was uh, here's my purpose here's what I've got to do now it's almost like uh, I know I know what I'm what I'm supposed to do um, 
I don't know if I have ever mentioned, I use an example uh, often. I used it this morning to explain something to somebody. But I use an example that says uh, if someone walked up to you on the street with a syringe of a deadly virus and they stuck it in your arm, um, two things. Number one, it was not your fault. Um, But number two, it is your problem. And how are you going to handle it? What are you going to do? What are you going to do with that? This wasn't my fault. um, But this was something that I was given. This was an opportunity um, to see if we could help other people from having to go through the same things. I'm very impressed with your positivity. Um, I know you miss your son. I do. I know you have your moments. How often does that happen? Mm. It happened a lot at first. Um, there are things that surprise you that trigger it every once in a while. Um, when you see something or you hear something or you... I try to protect myself. I'm very purposeful about what I allow into my mind. I'm very... Um, I, I, I believe wholeheartedly that we can choose to uh, to be happy or we can choose to be sad or we can choose to be angry, but it's our choice. Um, I try never to bring a cloud into a room. I try to always um, be a positive in every room that I go into. So I believe that that's a choice, but it, it happens every once in a while. Every so often I'll see something or hear something and it'll be a trigger, um, but... Um, but not very often anymore. One thing I've learned as I've researched this topic is that the schools can identify kids that they feel like are at risk to to some degree. But Gage didn't really fall into that group. He wasn't bullied, and there was no abuse or financial hardships, and he wasn't using any substances. What can we as individual people in the community do to help kids like Gage or even adults? Yeah, you're right. He didn't fall into... uh, categories that we would deem as uh, high risk um, as far as what we can do I, I really just think that it's it's just a, an overall perspective of trying to be positive as opposed to negative uh, we look at I mean we all have social media we all have Facebook and we all have all these things and and what you see on Facebook is the most positive thing about anybody's life no matter what they're going through and uh, I think it's about being more real uh, in our lives, hey, I got, I've got issues. I've got things that bother me. I've got this and that, but, but I'm going to take a chance to, to be positive uh, in this situation or that situation or this conversation. Um, pat somebody on the back, uh, give a good word. Y- you just never know how important that's going to be in somebody's life, and it, it, it may change their actual course of their life because you said something positive to them. You don't know that. I imagine you've been thrust into a role that you never imagined that you would be in. Do people reach out to you? Yeah, on many occasions, I've had other parents reach out to me. I've had, um, uh, you know, I've had a chance to speak uh, for uh, the House of Representatives because of a bill that they were presenting on suicide awareness training. Um, I've had a lot of different opportunities that I would never have imagined. Um, I've spoken for... um, a couple of uh, suicide awareness and prevention organizations, nonprofit organizations. Um, I've done some writing, uh, some articles that have been published that I, that I believe, and I've been told they, they've helped people and they've been passed around and they've, you know, somebody has attempted and then they've read something or seen something that I've done and then are able to get help. I know that, uh, well, I mean, if it helps one person, it's worth it, but I know that. Uh, as long as we're out there and we are being vocal about it, um, that it's going to help somebody. So yeah, I, I've had I've had a lot of opportunities that I would never uh, never imagined uh, through this process. Name one thing um, that Gage taught you from his life here. Oh, there's no doubt that uh, because he was looking to help the other person, uh, his selflessness. Um, and his ability to look somebody in the eye and know that they needed help or needed a, needed a pat on the back. Um, one time he came to me. We, we used to coach together. We coached uh, basketball for younger kids. 
and uh, before one game he came to me and he said uh, that that little girl it was fifth and sixth grade girls basketball that little girl uh, needs an extra pat on the back today dad I said I don't what do you mean um, he said well she's she's not doing well she needs an extra pat on the back well he didn't know any special inside information he just was attentive to the other person I did find out later that um, in fact um, about it, that that situation was about a month before he died, and in fact, after he died, uh, I had a mother reach out to me, and she said, "Yeah, he had he had made a a positive impact on that young lady's life, and that she had actually lost uh, a sibling uh, a week before, and was really of a heavy heart, and uh, he uh, was able to help her uh, just from a few good words." Now, if that's not something that we all need to learn from, I that's that's good stuff we need to pay attention if you pay attention you're going to see if you see it you need to be able to step up and and give a good word because it makes a difference in somebody's life and that's really impressive for a 15 year old yeah yeah there's people that say uh this person is an empath or this person he clearly um was teaching me and a lot of other people uh to look and be attentive because you can uh, you can see it if you look. Is there anything else that you want us to know? People that know me now that didn't know me then, um, and this was you know a little more than a year and a half ago. Um, people that know me now um, think I'm the most positive person they've ever met. Um, I've been told on many occasions that I'm a very positive person. I believe that you have a choice to be positive. You have a choice to be negative. You have a choice to be angry. Um, I'm actually writing a book on positivity and positive focus. Now, I'm not saying that my story is any more difficult than what anybody else is going through. But what we can do is we can be positive and we can choose to be positive in our own lives, and our own thoughts. I'm very careful about what I allow in um, and what I focus on. And um, every morning I focus on something positive. Um, every morning at, when we get to work, we focus on something positive. Um, there's, always, uh, there's always an opportunity to be negative. Um, just look at your social media. Just look at something that, that can get you riled up. Um, but you know, it's funny. We do this all the time. We, we, uh, we play a song, uh, to elicit a certain emotion in our lives because that song meant something to us at that time, or that song was, uh, important to us. It's positive, or we do it because we want to feel sad and we play a sad song that elicits a sad response. Uh, we program ourselves a lot. Uh, we just don't realize it. So you really have control over how you, pro you listen to a, a certain song when you work out because it gets your blood pumping. Um, or we sit down on the floor with a toddler and we do goo goo gaga and we get that toddler to smile and then it makes us smile and makes you feel good. We do these things. We have control over how we feel. Um, you're doing the same things with negativity. You just don't realize it. I think it's about just kind of gaining control and self-awareness and, um, programming for the positive, um, instead of allowing yourself to be programmed for the negative. That's all really good stuff. Dave, thank you so much for being here. Um, I wish I'd had the opportunity to know Gage. He sounds like he was a really amazing and caring kid. Um, I know that you're grateful for the time that you did have with him, and he was lucky to have you as a father, and I just appreciate you sharing your story. Absolutely, Patty. Thank you for doing what you're doing with this podcast. Thank you for uh, the heart that you have for this mission and this purpose. Um, I think you're doing wonderful things, and no matter what the response is or what the response that you hear, um, this is being uh, a positive impact in somebody's life, and I thank you for that. Thank you. In the Shadows is currently looking for sponsors to keep this project going. Visit intheshadowspod.com. In our next episode, we had a really difficult childhood. Um, it was it was 
really hard to say the least. Uh, she, whenever I say protector, she was the person that kept us sisters safe. Um, and that was a lot of, res- a lot of responsibility. When she wrote a letter, she had said that it was something that she had thought about since she was, you know, nine, ten years old. Please visit InTheShadowsPod.com for more information and to subscribe to this podcast series. You can also subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube. Help us educate and change the statistics in our community by sharing this podcast on social media. If you need immediate help, please call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255, or you can text the Crisis Helpline at 741-741. In Springfield, Missouri, you can also send a text to Dr. Mike Ferguson, psychologist, suicidologist, and mental health coach, at 417-501-9622. And on our final note, as we've said before, please remember to be kind to everyone. We don't know what challenges others are facing on any given day, and a smile from you could turn their world around. You lifted me up when I fell down, when I would mess up, you showed me how. I'm gonna miss you more than you could imagine, you could fathom in my love for you. Is greater than a chasm And I wish this never had to happen Cause every day I miss you Missing you